Grace and peace are yours from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. What a joy to be able to gather together around God's Word once again virtually this week as we worship at home at Bethel Lutheran Church. My name is Pastor John Rash. I've been the pastor here for two years now. A couple of quick announcements before we get started. We're continuing to call for a new pastor. If you hadn't heard, Pastor Silas Schmitzer returned the call to serve as pastor here. And that means on October 19th, I'm not sure when you'll be watching this, but on October 19th at 6 p.m., we will plan on holding another call meeting where we'll examine a list of candidates. And by God's grace, we will plan on calling them to serve here as a pastor in English and Spanish. Um, Any other announcements you might need will show up in this week's mailing this week's email, or on the website. So please do check out the website, www.bethelmenasha.org, for more news, notes, and up-to-the-date information and announcements from us here. We'll be following the order of worship as we've been doing in the past. It'll show up on your screen. If you'd like to give an offering towards God's work here, you can find uh, a link in the description of this video. God's blessings as we worship Him together today. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. We have come into the presence of God who created us to love and serve Him as His dear children, but we have disobeyed Him and deserve only His wrath and punishment. Therefore, let us confess our sins to Him and plead for His mercy. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus my Savior, I pray, have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. God our Heavenly Father has forgiven all your sins. By the perfect life and innocent death, Of our Lord Jesus Christ, he has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. May God give you strength to live according to his will. Amen. Let's pray. Almighty God, in your bountiful goodness, keep us safe from every evil of body and soul. Make us ready with cheerful hearts to do whatever pleases you. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. King Manasseh shows up in the line of the Savior in Matthew chapter 1. And if you read through that genealogy of Christ, it's perhaps a name you might just gloss over. It's one King Manasseh is not one that we know very well. You're going to hear about his reign as king of God's people in our first reading this morning. And what you read might be surprising. He's not uh, what you would call a God-pleasing king. And as shocking as Manasseh might be, the grace of God shocks us more. And that grace doesn't even show up in this first reading. We learn in the book of Chronicles, as Manasseh's reign is is, um, laid out for us there, that after all that you're going to hear, Uh, in this first reading. After all of this, Manasseh repents and God forgives him. And when Manasseh dies, he goes to rest with his fathers. And as far as we know, we'll see him in heaven in spite of all his evil actions. A reading from the book of 2 Kings. Manasseh was 12 years old when he became king and he reigned in Jerusalem 55 years. His mother's name was Hephzibah. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord. Following the detestable practices of the nations the Lord had driven out before the Israelites, he rebuilt the high places his father Hezekiah had destroyed. He also erected altars to Baal and made an Asherah pole, as Ahab king of Israel had done. He bowed down to all the starry hosts and worshipped them. He built altars in the temple of the Lord, of which the Lord had said, In Jerusalem I will put my name. In the two courts of the temple of the Lord, he built altars to all the starry hosts. He sacrificed his own son in the fire. He practiced divination, sought omens, and consulted mediums and spiritists. He did much evil in the eyes of the Lord. 
arousing his anger. He took the carved Asherah pole he had made and put it in the temple of which the Lord had said to David and to his son Solomon, In this temple and in Jerusalem which I have chosen, out of all the tribes of Israel, I will put my name forever. I will not again make the feet of the Israelites wander from the land I gave their ancestors. <laughs> Excuse me. If only they will be careful to do everything I commanded them, and will keep the whole law that my servant Moses gave them. But the people did not listen. Manasseh led them astray, so that they did more evil than the nations the Lord had destroyed before the Israelites. The Lord said through his servants, the prophets, Manasseh king of Judah has committed these detestable sins. He has done more evil than the Amorites who preceded him, and has led Judah into sin with his idols. Therefore, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I am going to bring such disaster on Jerusalem and Judah that the ears of everyone who hears of it will tingle. I will stretch out over Jerusalem the measuring line used against Samaria and the plumb line used against the house of Ahab. I will wipe out Jerusalem as one wipes out a dish, wiping it and turning it upside down. I will forsake the remnant of my inheritance and give them into the hands of enemies. They will be looted and plundered by all their enemies. They have done evil in my eyes and have aroused my anger from the day their ancestors came out of Egypt until this day. The word of the Lord. Remember, after all God says, in repentance, Manasseh returns to him and God repents of his own anger. That's the good news of God. He can forgive us too. We join together reading responsively select verses from Psalm 118. The Lord is my strength and my defense. He has become my salvation. The Lord's right hand is lifted high. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things. I will not die but live and will proclaim what the Lord has done. I will give you thanks for you answered me. You have become my salvation. The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. The Lord has done it this very day. Let us rejoice today and be glad. Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. His love endures forever. The Word of the Lord. Alleluia. I will proclaim your name to my people. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. Alleluia. We join together singing our first hymn. After the hymn, we will hear a sermon, a message from God's word.
Our text for today is the Gospel reading, Matthew chapter 21, verses 33 through 43. This is a parable told to us by Jesus. He says, listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard. He put a wall around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he rented the vineyard to some farmers and moved it to another place. When the harvest time arrived, he sent his servants to the tenants to collect his fruit. The tenants seized his servants. They beat one, killed another, and stoned a third. Then he sent other servants to them more than the first time, and the tenants treated them the same way. Last of all, he sent his son to them. They will respect my son, he said. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to each other, This is the heir. Come, let's kill him and take his inheritance. Then they took him and threw him out in the vineyard and killed him. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do with these tenants? He will bring those wretches to a wretched end, they replied. And he will rent the vineyard to other tenants who will give him his share of the crop at harvest time. Jesus said to them, have you never read in the scriptures? The stone the builder rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this and it's marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people who will produce its fruit. This is the gospel of our Lord. In the name of our risen and ascended Savior, our master teacher, dear fellow redeemed. I think it's safe to say that everyone likes stories. They like listening to stories. They like listening how stories affect others because finally we don't like stories if they hit close to home. Sure, we like to hear how other people deal with the problems of this world and perhaps from time to time we even make fun of them because we think, ah, we would never act that way. We're far better than that because we're better than the people in the stories. Maybe that's how many felt when they heard Jesus tell parables, which you know is nothing more than an earthly story, but it has a heavenly meaning. Now we know that there were times when even the disciples didn't get the meaning of the story. They had to come and ask Jesus to explain it to them. Other times they got the meaning right away. And the parable in front of us is one of those parables that everyone understood right away. In the verses after our text, which we didn't read, Matthew records for us that the Pharisees and the leaders knew Jesus was talking about them. And they got so angry they wanted to arrest Jesus right then and there, but they were afraid that the crowds would become angry since the average individual on the street was eagerly listening to what Jesus was saying and would not listen to what the leaders were saying at the time. We know that changed later during Holy Week, but that was not the situation now. So what's in this parable that made the leaders so angry? All Jesus was talking about is about a group of workers in a vineyard. But the point that the parable makes is this. How are you going to obtain or get the inheritance that you feel you deserve? For centuries, mankind wanted to earn it. Now Jesus says clearly something different. And that made the leaders angry. And you know what? It makes people around us today as angry as well. This parable has just as much value for us and those around us that we need to take a deeper look at it again so we can be reassured in the pathway that God has laid out for us as we obtain the inheritance. Jesus uses a simple setup for a story that everyone could understand. There's a vineyard. There's some workers. The owner does not work the vineyard. His workers do. And it's clear that the owner owns the vineyard and the workers work the vineyard. There's no ambiguity. Each participant has a specific role. Where the story gets interesting is when the participants start to think outside of their roles. Specifically, the workers think that they deserve to be the owner. So every time the owner sends someone to collect this portion of the harvest, the workers create this specific scenario. They seize that servant. In fact, the parable tells us this has happened over and over again. And the servants escalated, sorry, the workers escalated their take on the servants. First, they beat some servants. And then finally, they just start killing some servants. And they get to the point where they not just kill them, but they're beating them and they're stoning them. That's a pretty bad way to die. And so finally, 
the owner decides to change his approach a little bit. He sends his son. In his mind, the owner thinks that when the workers see the son, they're going to respect the son like they ought to respect the owner. So they're going to listen to him. But you know what the parable says. They did the same thing to the son that they did to the servants ahead of them. Because now the workers think that, well, if, if we get rid of the son, we can rise up and we can grab this inheritance as our own. Somehow or another, the inheritance will move from the son to the workers, whether by fiat or by force. Sounds ridiculous, right? From our vantage point in history, this story just does not make sense. When does a worker rise up to take what is not his and claim it? There's no action by the workers that's going to change them from workers to sons or inheritors. And Jesus wraps up the action part of the story by simply pointing to the fate of those workers who felt that their own activities would change their relationship with the owner. That by mistreating his servants, killing some, and finally killing the son, they would somehow now inherit the vineyard. In other words, because of what they were doing now, what they had not done in the beginning would become theirs without any great sacrifice. The owners, they don't pander to the workers. They are done working in this vineyard. They have no future with the owner. In fact, Jesus posed this simply by asking a question. What do you think ought to be done with them? And the crowd is right. Well, the owner should take these guys and he should just completely destroy them. And then the owner should go find some workers who know that they are workers and that relationship can be reestablished. We know what the parable is saying because that's made clear when Jesus quotes an Old Testament verse to highlight the point. Guess what? You reject the stone, which is the sun, And now that stone, which you rejected, has become the most important stone of the whole building, the cornerstone. It's the stone on which the whole building finds its base, its squareness, its direction, its foundation, its support. Without the cornerstone, the building would just be a pile of rocks. With the cornerstone, the building takes place, takes shape, and it's solid. It's all on the cornerstone, not the rest of the stones. The rest of the stones would mean nothing, but the cornerstone brings them together. That's Jesus. Jesus is the cornerstone. He's the son of the owner who the workers killed after having eliminated all the prophets who had come before him. God sent his son to his people Israel to provide them with the inheritance. But the people thought they could get the inheritance through their own efforts. And you and I need to be very careful. Because we're going to think that we can judge the Israelites very severely here. When you and I have acted the exact same way way too often in our lives. We have killed the prophets who have shared God's word with us. Well, not literally. And I know our pastors thank us for that. But every time we disregard the word and claim that does not apply to us, we're killing prophets. And you and I have also killed Jesus. Now, we did not have a physical hand in that, but it was our sins that nailed Jesus to the cross. It was our sins that was on Jesus' shoulders when he went to the cross. Every time we look to our own efforts, our own work, and you know and I know what they are. Yep, I'm a good enough person. At least I'm better than so-and-so. I'm a faithful church attender. I come as often as I can. In fact, even during this entire time, I'm still coming to church when I can. I work hard at being a Christian. So because of all that, oh, God must love me. Inheritance must be mine. Because of my work, the worker has risen up and grabbed the inheritance for his own. That's not the case. You and I know that. We're the workers. We're not the owner. We can't claim the inheritance. The inheritance has been given to us. Because the inheritance belongs to the owner. He chooses to give it to us. 
It's because of our Father's incredible great love for us miserable workers that he sent his only son to be that cornerstone, to set the building up and make it right in every way. Perfect as he is perfect, holy as he is holy. It's not us, we're the workers. We're just stones sitting out in the field. But it's the owner who brings these stones together, binds them through the Holy Spirit connected to that cornerstone so that perfect, holy, straight, built up together. It's the owner who has done that. It's the owner who has determined that this inheritance will be ours, and he's blessed us with it through that cornerstone, which today is seen so clearly in that precious word of God, which we preach and hear and read, and through the sacraments of the Lord's Supper and baptism. See, this parable applies to you and me today. We're workers. Let's never forget that. There's nothing we can do to obtain our inheritance for ourselves. By the grace of God, he has given us that inheritance. And because of his grace, you and I are people then who are producing fruit in light of that inheritance. Amen. May the peace of God which surpasses all of our human understanding, may that peace guard and keep our hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen. Thank you for sharing that message with us, Pastor Flunker. Now, as a group of believers, we join together and lift up our hearts as we pray to God. In our prayers today, we'll ask for God to guide us during this time of vacancy. And we'll also ask him to be with the family of Michael Douglas, Bethel member who recently passed away. We pray. Dear Lord, thank you so much for the gift of your word, because in it we learn about your love and your forgiveness, even for stubborn sinners like ourselves. Forgive us, then, we pray, for all of our sins of disrespect, for our sins of rejecting you. Uh, let us not harbor in our hearts the kinds of evil things that would push you away, but rather draw us closer to you through your word. Remind us of the good news of the forgiveness of sins, which is already ours through faith in Christ Jesus. Dear Lord, we also come before you today asking to be with us. Grant us patience, grant us peace, grant us wisdom, give us hearts that are willing to work hard to serve you. Um, not only here at church, but everywhere, especially we think during this time of vacancy. Guide the voters' assembly of Bethel as they join together soon to call another man to serve here as a pastor in both English and Spanish. Uh, may our thoughts and our discussions and our deliberations be pleasing in your sight. And if it is your will, dear Lord, lead a man to come here to, to work in this harvest field. We know that you can do it and we know that you will bless us regardless of what happens. We also ask you to be with the family of Michael uh, as they grieve his death. Remind them of the promises that Michael held secure his whole life, the promises of eternal life earned by your son, uh, the son that he now sees face to face in heaven. We're grateful for Michael's walk of faith and we're grateful that he now is in paradise with you this very day. Bless the family Comfort them with that same knowledge and keep them growing closer to you and in the faith until the day that they should die and meet you face to face. This is the promise that you give us and it's the hope that we all have. We pray all these things in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. And we join together to pray the prayer that he taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, go in peace, live in harmony with one another, and serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Let's sing our closing hymn. I want to walk as a child of the light. I want to follow Jesus. That said the stars to
Thanks again for worshiping together with us today. Uh, I, I say it all the time and I really mean it. It's a joy and a privilege to be able to gather together with you and to serve you as your pastor. I pray that God blesses you not only today but throughout your week. And remember, if you have any questions or comments or anything you need from me, if you haven't received Lord's Supper in a while and you want to receive Lord's Supper, reach out to me through my phone number, which many of you might have, or the email address, which you can find easily in the Contact Us section of the Bethel website. And if you have any other concerns, uh, we try to keep the website up to, as up-to-date as possible. That's BethelManasha.org. Um, you can find everything you need there. God's blessings to you all, and I hope to see you sometime soon. Until we meet again, bye-bye.